name is Al Williams. I'm the executive director of Northampton Community Television in Northampton, Massachusetts, and I welcome you all tonight to our screening of The Throwaways. Um, Northampton Community Television, if you aren't aware, is your community media center here in Northampton, Mass. Um, I encourage you to check out what it is we do. Um, we are one of the sponsors of this film tonight. Um, our website's northamptontv.org. Um, we're a resource for the community to um, learn tools of expression, multimedia tools. Um, we have a wide variety of equipment and training and resources for people to um, express yourself politically, artistically, really in any fashion that you wish. Um, tonight we are uh, hosting a really special event for us, and that is um, because the co-director, there are two co-directors of this film, The Throwaways, that we are presenting tonight. One of them is named Ira McKinley, um, and he's here tonight. Uh, some of you may know Ira, and Ira was a Northampton resident. Um, I met him for the first time in 2008 when he came to Northampton Community Television to use this as a resource. Um, he was someone who, um, if you know Ira, he has a tremendous amount of passion and a tremendous amount of energy. And um, he isn't shy, and he is somebody who was looking for a way to um, have, have some support for his voice. Um, when we encountered him, he was, he was homeless at the time. He was living in a tent in the woods in Northampton. Um, he had been formerly incarcerated. He was a war veteran. And um, he spent time with us um, learning, learning tools in, in the manner that we can teach, learning how to produce video, learning how to become a filmmaker. And um, there's a lot to Ira's story after, after he was with us. He was our producer of the year in 2009. And we were really proud to host um, Ira. He, was in, he spent some time interning with us as well. Um, and this, in 2015, is his product years later, after a journey um, which he left us and went to various places um, in the United States, mostly Albany, New York. Um, and you're going to see some of his journey on screen here tonight in the throwaways. Um, stick around after, because there will be a Q&A with uh, Ira and his co-director, Bawen Suchek. Um, and I'm going to introduce Bowen in a second here to introduce the film. There are also t-shirts and DVDs for sale in the lobby. So if you do need to leave at some point, check those out. Um, as well as a sign-up sheet for what's called the Western Mass Media Justice Network. And there is a group of people in Western Massachusetts who, has, uh, who have some concern about media justice, media uh, social justice. And if you have interest in that issue, please do sign up and it'll put you on an email list for that discussion group. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Bawin Suchek, uh, who's co-director of The Throwaways. Thank you for coming, everyone. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Um, first off, obviously, I just want to give a really big uh, shout out to NCTV, Al Williams, and Henry. I mean, you guys really kind of did a lot of the legwork here in town to make this happen because um, myself, I'm based in Albany, New York, and Ira's in the Ithaca area now. So, so you guys really went all out to kind of make this event happen. And I'm um, thank you to the Academy of, of Music and Theater for hosting us. Um, so as Al said, I'm the co-director of the film. And you know, I don't, I'm not going to really talk too much about the film except to say that um, you know, when, when Ira and I met, Ira actually had this idea in his head that I, you know, I'd never met Ira. He kind of just walked up to me and, <clears throat> and kind of pitched this idea to me because he knew I was a, a filmmaker in Albany and I was running a program for um, youth that teaches filmmaking. And he kind of just saw me and, you know, kind of basically, you know, said, you're going to make this film with me. I had no idea who Ira was, but you, you, a lot of you guys who, who know Ira know that that's his style and it actually is you know, something that has really helped him to kind of, you know, make a lot of progress in his own personal life because of that conversation, we standing here today presenting this film. And the thing that's so powerful about our story of making this film is this meeting happened back in the summer of 2011. And at that time, no one was really having the conversation around um, mass incarceration, around police brutality, except for in a small select, you know, pockets of activism and folks who are working on prison justice issues. So, you know, we had a struggle to get to this place where we're actually, you know, presenting this film across the country. We've been in, 
you know, pretty much every area in the country. We were on in the West Coast a couple of months ago and did, um, you know, seven sold out shows on the West Coast. And I've taken the film all across the country to festivals and universities. And the thing that's really incredible is that when we started, no one was talking about this. And then when we finished the film, which was in April of 2014, um, when premiered in New York City, people still weren't really talking about it. And it was like, well, you know, yeah, it's just kind of like a fringe issue, like only a few people talk about police brutality. And then of course, August Ferguson happened and, and, and everything kind of changed. But for those of us who are of color, you know, this is an issue that we always um, have had to confront because it's, for, for some of us, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of, um, you know, having a lot of close calls or having friends and family who have been affected by the issue of mass incarceration or police brutality. So it's a very personal story. So we're not going to show you guys statistics and a lot of talking heads. We're going to show you a story. And to me, and I, and I believe I speak for Iron when I say almost the most important part of the film is not just showing it to you, but having a conversation afterwards. And I think it fits perfectly in with the mission that NCTV has kind of set out for themselves, which is to engage the community through media. So media is not this thing that we just sit back and kind of consume, but it's a conversation, it's an engagement. So we really hope you guys stick around tonight. Thank you all for coming out and, and really hope you enjoy the film. Listen, you know what, um, this is just for my personal, you know, this is just for my personal stuff. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight, you know what I'm saying? Northampton is a home to me too, and I'm proud to bring this documentary here. Um, I wish we could have filled them seats up there, but you know what, we're still good. You know, tell people about this, and we, we um, the film is good, but this conversation is what's better. Thank y'all. Yo, you want to clap again, too? Yo, give me that. Bitch. Um, so, uh, Bowen, maybe you want to start just talking a little bit about the film, and um, we'll take questions. This is a discussion from the audience. I don't have a microphone, so, if, so if whenever you want to sort of call for questions, People can indicate that to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll approach you with a microphone so you can, you can talk to these guys here today, but maybe you want to just open it up, talking a little bit about um, what we just saw. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you. First of all, thank you all for uh, sticking around for the conversation. I think it's a really important time to be having conversations about some of the themes and the topics in the film. Um, but I think first and foremost, you know, just for myself as a filmmaker, um, you know, I come from a background as being a teacher as well, and I, I have a uh, film uh, program called Youth FX where I teach kids filmmaking. And at the core of really what I'm trying to teach them is to use film and visual media as a means to tell stories and in order to connect with each other. Because I really think, you know, as much as we talk about this idea of everybody having, you know, um, the internet and cell phones and, and us being connected, I feel like at times it feels like we're more disconnected than ever. Um, and I think partially it's because of the speed by which these images are kind of coming at us. And I think it's important for Ira and I to create a film that really stretches out time a little bit so that you have to kind of sit and let some of the imagery and the story kind of linger so that it's not just, you know, um, a quick video that you see on YouTube that in some ways can sort of be in and out of your head as instantly, um, you know, as you see it. So for me, you know, I'm really interested to, you know, sort of engage about the issues, but also, you know, it's, it's really about telling a story because I think that what's going to happen, um, the sort of future uh, of this country and how we're going to kind of address the issues that were right in front of us right now um, is going to be about how we decide to connect with each other and kind of let go of some of the preconceived notions that we have about each other and, uh, and come together. Because there's really no other way we're going we're gonna to really um, change the system unless we start coming together as people and communities um, and, and really acknowledging some of the hard truths 
that we have to to kind of deal with. So, so I hope that this, you know, film, you know, it's like the film is, you know, something to hopefully provoke you and, and make you feel something, you know, because that's really what we're out, out setting out to do. I want to, um, first of all, there's a couple of people in this audience that have been with me on this journey and they've been with me and they've known me for years and I just want to give them a shout out to, and thank you for sticking by me. Tom, he know when I, when, when I was homeless, Tom, you wanna stand up Tom? Let him know who you are. He gave me a place to stay. And there's people like that that we need to contribute and, 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 and take a look, you know, regardless what was going on, he believed in what I was doing. Mr. Henry White, who's now the board president of NCTV, he also believed in what I was doing. Uh, these young ladies over here from SafeNet, they came in here, and I forgot all about them, but they introduced themselves to me. They're like, yo, you better not forget us, because you know, when you was homeless, we gave you, you know, and you seen, like I said, um, the same thing that Bowen said, that's the same thing, the reach I was saying to you, and you were trying to calm me down, and like, okay, these people don't understand the situation. But I had that anger in that fight. Miss Amy Book, Bookbinder, she's sitting over there, uh, one day I did a, a <laughs> out here in Pulaski Park, and I did a festival, and there was a guy named Boxcar, and he gave me the runaround, and Amy was like, yo, put him on, put him on. And I was like, no, nah, because she was like, put him on. And because of Amy, she made me understand that, you know, we all have a, uh, have a story to tell. So there's a lot of people in this room. Mr. Ryan Hommel, are you still here, Ryan? Yes, that guy is an awesome musician, and he's touring. There are, there are people that supported me and believed in my story that I wanted to send a shout out to. I know it's a, a, a few and far between. There's a young lady here, African American sister, where she at, and, and we did some singing, and I wanted her to sing. I think she's sitting over here, but you know she supported. There you go, right there. Stand up, young lady. You know who I'm talking to. Right there, you, miss, you and your sister. But anyways, she's being shy. But she has a powerful voice, you know, and it reminded me of Maya Angelou when, we, when she was doing her, her pieces. So these are stories that need to be expressed. And I thank everybody for supporting me here and coming out tonight. Um, this is special. This is to me like my second home because I went through another phase here and I had to, I had to learn how to grow. So everybody had an integral part in me growing here. Um, Sarah Bernier and um, Chris Guerin, they were part of my posse, you know what I'm saying? We did some, we did some singing. So we were out there singing every day, and we brought the singing that we, we, we was doing at, the, uh, at these places that were doing karaoke, and we brought it out here. So it's all a process, and the thing is, we, can't, we, we have to learn how to love one another. And that's, that's what I've learned through this journey. Without love, it's nothing. We have questions from the audience? Or? Does anyone have a question? Reactions? Different jurisdictions throughout the United States are exper experimenting with body, uh, police body-worn cameras. I know in a lot of cases the civil rights uh, lawsuits that can um, follow uh, an, inc an incidence of uh, police brutality uh, can sometimes uh, rise or fall on the um, existence of video footage. What do you think about uh, police body-worn cameras in general? Uh, do you feel like the, uh, the, the possible benefits might outweigh the, the privacy intrusions on the individual and so forth? Is that part of the conversation? Just want to get your thoughts. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say that body cameras are a step, um, but I want to say that if you look at the issue um, of, of, of policing, I mean, what we're talking about is a culture 
of, of, of power and control over certain people in this country um, that is exercised through the policing, um, specifically that happens in black communities and, and poor brown communities across this country. Because, you know, um, I'm sure if you went to some of the wealthier suburbs in this area, you're not gonna have racial profiling and stop and frisk happening on a regular basis. I'm sure if you go to Smith College, um, there's not cops walking around looking to bust you for smoking weed um, or racially profiling people on that campus. So I think it's really about the policies and the culture of policing beyond the sort of apparatus that the police have on them. Because if you think about the Eric Harris incident, which just happened um, maybe two weeks ago, and this was in Oklahoma, and this is the, the one where we had you know, this insane you know, circumstance where you have a volunteer police officer who gets to carry a gun, who I guess bought his way into the police force, which is just ridiculous, who by the way is now on vacation in the Bahamas while he awaits um, trial for, for, for killing this man. They had body cameras on them, right? So the body cameras just served as a way to capture the police killing someone. They didn't prevent the police from killing someone. Now, I'm not saying that they won't prevent in some cases, but I think it's important for us to not get caught up in some of these reforms as a solution to the entire problem or to the problem that we really have to address, which is you know, white supremacy and racism in this country and how it's played out through the policing of poor brown communities across the country. So, you know, so I think, yes, body cameras are great. You know, reform is great, but it's not an answer, and it doesn't address the real core root of the issue um, that I think is a problem that has to still be talked about. Me personally, um, everywhere I go, I get arrested, so it doesn't really matter. I'm, I mean, I, 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 I speak up, though, and so they have an issue with me defending myself, but I know my rights. A lot of people don't know their rights, and they get caught up in this, in the system. And if we educate, and, and this is the thing that we gotta do, that's, that's the key word, education. Education on what your rights are, education what you need to do, and education, so yeah, body cameras are good, but I have my own camera. You see what they did, they, they try to shut me down for filming, but I knew my rights. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not turning off this film, and there was many incidents that I was filming and I knew it, and this is before it became popular that we all have phones and some of our phones have cameras on it. So we can film our own stuff, you know what I'm saying? If, what was the guy in South Carolina? And not, that, that's a different story, we got shot in the back. But you see what the man said, he's like, oh, I, I, I fear for my life, you know what I'm saying? He grabbed my taser, he did this, he did that, and that wasn't the truth. So yes, the cameras can show that, but then, you know what I'm saying, if you have the power to edit like I do, <laughs> you, can, you can develop the story the way you want to develop it. So we have to be careful of what we're showing. And that's one of the things that I, I'm concerned about because, yeah, you give this stuff to the police and they can still edit it to make them look good. You got to get that raw footage, and I know Al knows what I'm talking about, and Henry knows what I'm talking about, and a lot of people in this room knows what I'm talking about. That got to show the confrontation from the beginning to the end. Yep. Good evening. Thank you for the film. So f throughout that film, the issues, so for example, when you go to a, uh, a press conference, you're talking poverty, you're talking housing, you're talking education, you're taking pictures of abandoned buildings. You could have entered this story and you could have made the focus of the story any one of those so-called issues. We could talk about education, we could talk about housing, we could talk about poverty, we could talk about violence, we could talk about... You chose to make the, the sharpest point, police brutality and, 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 and police killings. And I wonder why you made that choice. Why is that, of all those issues, why is that the one that's, that's right at the, at the forefront? I'm, I'm going to chime in first, and I'm gonna let Bowen, you know, um, 
when we made this film, we, were, we, we started it during the Occupy. We thought that was it. We thought we Occupy Wall Street, the voices was gonna be heard from those who were oppressed. That turned out to be, to me, and, and we've seen it, dominated by white males again, you know what I'm saying? And it was a power thing. Instead of using people of color and women and let them be the forefront, it was still a power issue, and we've seen that. So we switched that, because we're like, Psh, you're not telling the story. So let us tell the story. And so the thing is, is that we have to, we, we wanted to tell a story of those who are really oppressed. And the big issue that we dealt with, and, and Bowen helped me with this, was like, you know, the shootings. And, and, and all this is therapeutic, you know what I'm saying? Of me doing this, this took us, what, three years of film? One year of festivals. So I went through a whole nother thing where I had to come to grips with me being arrested, people being shot and killed, to the point where I just was going crazy. And I'm like, don't you see it? You know what I'm saying? Don't you see these people just being shot and killed? And you saying, well, he, he had a gun, he did this, he had that, you know what I'm saying? And that was not even the truth. You know, the, same, the thing that's happening in Baltimore, where they broke this guy's spine, these are stories that are coming out. But if we didn't make this, this, these stories wouldn't be relevant now. And as long as you keep killing black men or people of color, even women of color, this story is gonna be relevant. And you guys gotta understand that the, uh, Northampton has a, um, a history and they have a solution to the problem. So we wanna talk about solutions. My solution was learning how to film NCTV. Okay, so I could get the story out. This young lady said that they had a problem with me because of my voice, and I was the scary black man, you know what I'm saying? And they always use that. And I'm like, well, I, you can't use this excuse now that I have a film, and I wanna show you the realness of what's going on. But thank you for that question, sir. I, I just wanna add that I think that one thing that's really important that I feel like you, you, you're talking about, you picked up on is that there's all these issues, right? So, we have to think about the fact that, you know, these issues are all interlocking. There's not one singular thing that causes that, right? But it's like, you have poverty, you have lack of opportunities, you have lack of education. This is my neighborhood. What you see up there, that's where I live. Um, and I work in organizations and, 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 and with people that are trying to change the situation, but not trying to change it to be like, oh, you got to get out of the hood. Because, like, what's the message when you tell people you got to get out of the hood? You know what I'm saying? We're trying to change, we're trying to empower people to change their communities themselves. And the, the biggest challenge is the city government and the officials getting the hell out of the way and providing the resources. Because I think once we let go of the fact that the state and that apparatus that has created all these issues is really not interested in making it better or changing it, and we have to do it ourselves, then we can start moving forward. And I, that's why I work with young people, because I think young people have a lot of passion and energy that gets directed in ways that you know, their, their ideas are deemed negative or the way they speak them or the way that they act or the way they wear their clothes is sort of, you know, thrown back at them. And to answer your question directly about, well, why did the focus become police brutality and mass incarceration? Because those are the people who are being thrown away. I mean, that is the direct, you know, starkest example of being thrown away. I mean, Mike Brown being shot and killed and then left in the street for four hours in a hot sun in front of other people and residents of his community you know, what does that tell you about the value of black lives? And that's why people say when black lives matter. You know what I mean? Because to, to this country, it doesn't seem like they do. And we see that message over and over again. So that's why we chose to focus on that particular issue out of all the issues. Uh, thank you so much for the movie and the work you both do. Um, I have a question about uh, the violence against queer and trans folks of color. And I have been educating myself uh, about that issue. And, uh, you know, have someone like Cece McDonald, who has been such an important voice, um, is speaking out and up about that, the outrageous rates of violence against uh, that specific uh, community. Uh, so it's not something that's in the movie. But I would like to hear from both of you what you you know what you have experienced in in your community in those communities that you you bring to the movie, 
uh, in your perspective in general? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we actually, we did a very uh, powerful screening in Los Angeles um, to an organization called um, A New Way of Life that works with folks who are formerly incarcerated. And there was a young woman who was um, recently, she had literally a week before, so the audience was primarily folks who were part of this organization and worked with them. So it was mainly people who were um, incarcerated. And there was a woman, young woman, 24 years old, who had just gotten out of prison, and she was queer. And one of the things she talked about was the fact that for her, it's like this double, you know, sort of, this, like, two layers. It's like once, like, the cops harass her because she's black, and then they realize that she's not a, she's not a dude, she's a woman. You know, because the way she dresses and the way she carries herself. What, I, don't know, I forget the term that she liked to identify herself as. Um, but, you know, she was a very male-appearing female, and she was queer. And so she talked about the fact that, you know, in her perspective, it's like, the police, the way that she's being policed as a human being is the fact that the, the cops who are primarily white in the neighborhood that she lives in, who are policing her, don't like her because she's black and they don't like her because she's queer. You know, so she's facing these double, you know, um, sort of levels of oppression. And one of the things she talked about is like, it's just the difference. It's the fact that a lot of people in this country are not educated about the fact that differences are to be celebrated, not to be hidden away and not talked about, you know, and I think that points to the issue of education, you know, because it's like we grow up in a society that really has like a pretty narrow viewpoint of what is normal, you know, and I think that that's really one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome, and that starts with young people, with children. I mean, little children, you know, three, four-year-olds, you know, teaching them that it's okay to celebrate people's differences, and I think when it gets to the position where you have police officers who are completely, you know, untrained, in, in understanding different, you know, forms of, of gender, different sexualities, different races, let alone, you know, who, who somebody is on the surface and who they identify as, to me it's not a surprise that that's happening, you know what I mean? So I think that absolutely we need to have more education around that because those are huge issues that I think were, are completely, a lot of people are completely ignorant, not just police, a lot of people are ignorant about those issues. And we all have something to learn. I mean, I have something to learn. I mean, but I'm an educator, and so I have to teach myself and make sure that I'm educated so that I can work with young people and be able to identify that. And we actually, in the program that, we, that I run um, this past summer, you know, we did a film about um, two girls who were actually together and falling in love with each other and the challenges that they had to face, which leads one of them to, think, to consider suicide. And one of the things it really did was brought up this conversation. You know, and that's part of what I think we have to talk about is the fact that we just are not having enough conversations about these things, right? Because in our school systems, we're just like hyper-focused on these tests and common core and just drilling these kids with ridiculous knowledge that they're just gonna forget. Well, we don't talk about humanness, you know, and how we're gonna relate to each other. So to me, that, you know, I, I completely agree that it's a big issue, and I think that we have to create spaces where we can have conversations about it. And one of the things that we're doing is talking about solutions. So. My brother, who was five years older than me, was gay, and he killed himself. And he was dead for 20-something days in Albany, New York. And he had this issue of him being not treated as a person because of his life choices. And me, too. And I had to come to grips with that. And this is 94. And I'm like, what would... Why, what would it mean, make me not visit my brother, you know, for a week? And he's dead for a week before we found him. You know what I'm saying? And I have to go in there and get the effects. So that, that and these are stuff that I never really dealt with, you know what I'm saying? Because that's his life, you know what I'm saying? And we talked about my father, but my father picked on him because, oh, you're gay, you're this, you're that. You know what I'm saying? You're not a man. You want to play with dolls instead of playing sports. And I was, one, and so my brother used to beat me up because my father used to, you know what I'm saying? And then realizing these issues. And that's why I'm saying this has to be something that we talk about and find solutions about. I have a great solution. I think my solutions are great. You know what I'm saying? The people, until now, they didn't, they, they didn't want to listen to what I was saying until Ferguson happened. And I'm like, why do we have to wait until things blow up, until you understand what I was saying to you four or five years ago? 
There's some people that understood what I'm saying. I mean, Al and the people that I was dealing with, Ryan and all them, we were trying to do this stuff out here at this, in Pulaski Park. They're about to rebuild it. But we had concerts out here. We were trying to say, yo, let's come together. So this stuff has been there, but it's, it's taking a, a situation where people are seeing it, it going to another level. It's not hidden. The first thing that you've seen was Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, the quote. I'm invisible because you refuse to see me. That's how I felt here. You know what I'm saying? I know those ladies over there wanted to, you know, say, well, I was a good guy, but they had a job. They're getting paid. They didn't want to lose their money. You know what I'm saying? And I was like forceful, like you, well, Bowen said, I'm like coming to you, like, yo, listen, I got this movie, you're gonna help me make it. <laughs> he didn't know who the hell I was. And I find that funny every time that he expresses that, because he didn't know who I was. But he believed in what I was saying, and he got on board. And so what we're saying to you guys, let's get on board on what's going on. Because right now, a lot of things happen, it's happening, and the foundations and, and the solutions is right here with you. So not a... Someone have a hand up here? I thought. My name is Vanessa. Um, I'm one of the organizers with the local chapter of Black Lives Matter. So some of the team came out. Um, thanks. So I wanted to thank you for having the courage to share your story. Um, and I have a question, but first I also kind of wanted to address um, the first two questions that were raised by white men who were the first two people to speak in response to your story um, and ask a question about why you would make the story about white supremacy or mass incarceration. Um, that is white supremacy, and black people are dying in this country every day, and on Monday, Rakia Boyd, who was 22 years old in Chicago, when she was shot dead by, un uh, when she was walking unarmed and she was shot dead by police, on Monday, um, the people who shot her were found not guilty. Um, Jasmine Richards, an organizer of Black Lives Matter in Los Angeles, was arrested and charged with terrorism charges, and Ayanna Jones was shot in Detroit while she was sleeping when she was seven years old. <clears throat> And what we saw with Walter Scott was that when police have body cameras, as the same as Eric Garner, we get to just watch um, black people being shot and choked to death um, every day. So we have more footage of this black death. There's still black death. So that, that's the answer about body cameras. Um, and even like asking why this would have to be the story is invalidating the story, so stop. Um, my, my question is, um, I think that, um, media and video in particular is a very powerful tool. And I think that um, as black people, as people of color, like the media often takes our stories and shifts our stories and tries to co-opt our stories and share our stories. So my question to you both is, how has this tool been used um, as an organizing tool in Albany? What have young people's responses been to this film? Um, yeah, and just to kind of the role of video as a form of, and telling our stories as a form of resistance and keeping culture alive, thanks. Um, well, first off, thank you for everything you just said and added to the conversation. Um, appreciate that um, and the work you guys are doing. You know what I'm saying? It does take sacrifice and time and energy and bravery to get out on the street and organize. And for some, you know, no one's getting paid for this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you got to want to do it. And it's really hard work. And um, media is, is, is really a powerful tool. And I think it's also something that we have to realize that is, is so important for us to deconstruct it so that we can understand what, it's, what the effect are on us as people. And I think specifically, like one of the things that I talk about with my youth organization where we create films is before we get to the point of creating stuff is to make sure that they understand that their imagery, the image of who they are as people and, who, and their culture is a manipulation and is being taken and used for profit. You know, and I think that's the thing we have to understand about the mainstream pop culture media machine is that it's all about profiting off of imagery. It's not about social change. So once we understand that, and young people, a lot of them don't understand that um, because it's so stimulating to them. And so I understand why it's very exciting to see these images and it, it works on your brain in a certain way. So once we figure that out, then we go about creating stuff. And one of the things, you know, it's like, when I, so I work at a, um, 
uh, my program is mainly summer program, but I've been working in a public high school for the last three years, and so I try to just drop these little videos in, and we talk a lot about films, and we, you know, we watch films about the Black Panthers, because you have 16 and 17 year old black kids in public high schools in America who have never heard of the Black Panthers. You know, and that's a crime. They've never heard of the Black Panthers, right? So that is, there's something wrong with that, that someone has to come with an after-school program and show them Black Power mixtape, and it's the first time for majority of the black kids in my group that I work with, who are 16 years old and older, of ever even hearing about it. So that's a problem, right? So we have to address that. And the fact that, you know, when I showed a video about stop and frisk, it was about a young man, and people might have seen this, who actually captured his stop and frisk incident on his um, phone, where the cop threatened to break his arm, and um, he was being racially profiled in the Bronx. He had been stopped twice that night already, and so he started recording it. And so many of the kids in the class were like, whoa, wait a minute, what, what do they call that? I was like, stop and frisk. And they're like, Yo, so there's a word for that? And I was like, yes. It's actually a policy of NYPD. It actually is, is for cops, it's something they have to do. You know, and, and I was stunned, you know, and I shouldn't be surprised, but I was shocked that kids who are experiencing these things on a regular basis are not equipped with the language and the tools to, to understand that this is a systematic thing. You know, so we use, again, so part of what we're doing is we're trying to help them understand those things, and then they can create. So when they create, they're coming at a place of power. They want to reclaim power. So media for us is power, and that's why it's so perfect that we teamed up with NCTV, because anybody in this room can walk into NCTV tomorrow, take a camera, and go make a film, go make a video, you know, um, document the protest. And they got grants, you know? right, L? They got grants. And they money. got grants now, you know. But I think it's important for us to understand that we have to teach about the ways that media is being used to manipulate before we can sort of start the creation process. Because I think the creation process comes out of us having an a analysis of what the media is doing. So the films that my kids are wanting to make is like, we want to show people things that are going on in community. It's not only stabbing each other at the high school, but the positive things going on. Start making narratives, telling their stories through, through scripts and through created stories that are all coming out of their own experiences. So, you know, media is a really beautiful thing, and I think that this film is just a perfect example of how it's a tool of power, you know, and, and the fact that we have so many, you know, corporate, you know, um, con uh, conglomerates that run the media, you know, we have to have places like NCTV, and we have to tell our own stories, because no one's going to tell them for us. And, Miss, what, what was the organization you're from, again? Black Lives Matter 413. Where? Black Lives Matter 413. Okay. Um, thank you for coming and speaking out. Um, you know, my suggestion to you is get a DVD. Um, show it to your people. And then have us come out and get we get paid too. No, I'm just kidding. But you know what I'm saying? But you know, all, all this is like, you know, we, we have to come together. And I thought, I, listen, I did a homeless artist showcase out here back in 2008. And the reason why I did it was because somebody was looking at me and they said, mm, what a waste. And I'm like, I'm a waste to you? Why? Because you're not hiring me? Because you're not helping me do what I gotta do? So everything that me and Bowman are doing now is like, this is self-produced stuff. So my thing is, if I could come from this story that you've seen and, and make it and know what's going on, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things I want to talk about, you know what I'm saying? I want to do an arts and music festival. I talked to Ryan about this earlier because I think arts and music is the way to reach people. I seen a, a video back in 1976 that was done by Earth, Wind & Fire, and that's the way of the world. And they spread out to the, the fans, and they were Hispanic, they were Asian, they were black, they were white, and it all came together. And they were clapping hands together with the music. So I'm saying we got to twist it. We, got, we let this, this propaganda, the Fox News, the MSNBC, all these other people coming together. And I forgot Miss Kaylin Kay. Did I say something? Miss Kaylin Kay still here? Yes. She talked about something. Let's talk about race before all this stuff happened. And she, was, she wrote a book. And she's touring now with that book, you know what I'm saying? And saying, let's talk about it. 
but nobody wanted to talk about it until Obama got elected. And I want to tell this story, and then I'm, uh, I'm going to let Tom, I know Tom, you wanted to speak. But I can't be, well, Obama got elected in 2008, and I was right here, right? I was right here in Northampton, and I'm watching the, you know, I'm watching the returns and all that. And then when he won, somebody, this white man came up to me and said, congratulations. And I was like, what the hell are you congratulating me for? You should congratulate yourself for voting for him. And then I knew, at that point, I knew we were in trouble. I was like, oh, snap, here we go. He congratulated me for a black man being, oh, now we're going to have to go through some stuff. And this is what I'm seeing six years later. And this is a true story. I was sitting, I was right up the street there. And the man came up to me and said, congratulations. And I was like, man, I had to think about it, you know. Why are you congratulating me? You know? You understand what I'm saying, young lady? You should congratulate yourself for voting for him. And if you didn't vote for him, well, congratulate the ones that did. But then I knew that we were going to have issues. You know what I'm saying? And that's the thing I think Bowen's talking about. But the youth and, and, and the women, the ones that have been oppressed from the start, are the ones that's going to make the difference. Woo. Go ahead. No, don't keep clapping for me. Clap for Bowen, too. <laughs> He's saying some positive stuff, too. Hi, my name is Manny. I'm a member of Black Lives Matter 1432 and also the Western Mass Coalition for Palestine. Uh, yeah. I want to ask tell you a couple of questions. The first is, first of all, uh, Sean and Ira, I want to show. I want to say that you guys are courageous just to come out and make a film about what is important. And many people do not know what's going on with black, with uh, police brutality. And you putting cameras in front of them without getting choked. I tell you, that takes, that takes a lot of courage. Um, I'm always about solutions. So we see every day black and brown people getting killed, and then these perpetrators getting away with it. So now my question is, what do you think we need, where do we need to start to make the changes on the penal and the, and the justice system so these people do not get away with it? That, what happened in South Carolina is one case, but what about a thousand cases that happen every month, every year? How do we get to change the, the system, especially the judicial system? How do we get to do that, and how do we change it? Well, that's a big question. I mean, I think everyone's asking that question. I don't think, um, um, you know, I don't think you want you know, necessarily two filmmakers aren't the pre people to ask that question. We should be asking people who you vote for, your elected officials, right? Um, but I will say my opinion about it is that I think every single city, every single town should have an independent um, citizen review board that reviews every single incident of police um, <laughs> violence against a, ci a, a citizen. Every single one should be reviewed by an independent board that includes some legal people, some educators, some people from the community, and they should have subpoena power, right? So that's the key, the subpoena power. Because we have all these citizen review boards and they can talk and they can talk and they can write these little reports, but they can't really do shit because they can't subpoena any of the cops. You know, so the cops stand behind this wall you know, of, of protection because there's no district attorney in this country that is gonna prosecute its own cops. Those cops work with the district attorney. You know what I'm saying? That's like, you know, you're just not gonna do that. So, we have to have that as a, as a starting point. So until that happens as a starting point, I mean, I, I don't know any other issues that can, any other things that can work. You know, it has to come from the community. And what I, I mean, and I think every single incident has to be reviewed, not just a police killing somebody. I think every time a, pol a police officer is overly aggressive or somebody files a report in some way, because one of the things that I, I've noticed, because I've done a lot of research about some of these cases that have been happening, is in most of the cases, the police officers who committed these, you know, these ultimately, you know, some of these, these murders, you know, like the really violent, you know, responses and the murders that are happening have all had incidences before. Okay, this guy in, 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 in Oklahoma, they told him he, he was unstable and he shouldn't even had a gun. Why the hell was he on the, uh, even on that call? The guy in um, the Tamir Rice case in Cleveland, he'd already been fired from another police department. Darren Wilson had been fired from a neighboring town. You know, the, the, the cops in John, in, when John Crawford was shot in Walmart. So we have, 
we can see this evidence. Uh, Daniel um, Pantaleno in Staten Island, he had had three cases that the NYPD had settled out of court for money. They paid off the families because he was overly aggressive and he had done you know, um, um, things that were not legal in arresting people. So there's patterns that we, can, we have established, but the cops are not going to stop the cops. They're just not going to do it. So that has to be the starting point. Mike, you know, before you speak, I want Tom and then you and we're going to... Um, Al, get the time, and then yes, you know I'm gonna come to you. But I want to say something about what he's saying. Now, what if I went out and started shooting white people? And I did. I wanted to shoot y'all, but I, I shot you with a camera instead. You know what I'm saying? So, but what if I did that? Then I'm gonna be demonized as this, you know, thug, this big black thug. You know what I'm saying? My thing is like now we have to read, you know, think about what we're shooting, what we're talking about, you know what I'm saying? Instead of me going out and filming and, and doing certain things, and I know Jenny, she, she did this thing. The first one of the first things she was Ira Diarate. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And I had to talk to her. I said, yo, Jen, you know, you need to, you know, redirect the way what I was saying at that, that post, you know what I'm saying? And this was like six years ago. And they were trying to do a, a thing with Northampton and redistricting it. And it, to me, it was gentrification all over again. And I spoke to them, and I spoke out. But as soon as I spoke out, they wanted to end the meeting. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. You want to end this stuff, you know, the things that really matters you're not talking about. So my thing is, you say that, but if I went in, I started shooting people, and I started doing certain things, then the narrative was still, well, he's a crazy black man. You know what I'm saying? And the thing is, I might be uh, El Loco, but I'm a local in the right way, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to make change, and it's positive change. I think uh, we're talking about solutions, and I think uh, Ira really hit it. And I think it's been lost in the, in the talk of pro, pro, police brutality and poverty and the thing. And, he, and the, word, the key word was love. And um, I loved Ira, and that's why we, he had, I invited him to come and live with us. And I was not fearful he was going to, I was going to come home one day and my TV was going to be missing or, I had, or my wife was going to, you know, be attacked or so. I, I, I trusted him. So there was a certain amount of risk, but I think it's, you know, we have to, we have to each, you know, not, I, I would never challenge anybody to just invite a homeless person into your house, but, but there are certain risks that we, we can each take in terms of reaching out, making friends outside of our own colors, or social, socioeconomic uh, uh, groups, and stuff like that. So I would just, I'd like you to address, you know, friend, friendship as a solution. You know, because I think that's, like, you, you know, you guys have a friendship. You've made friends probably in the making of your film. And, and you have friends here. And we're friends. We're friends because we care about these things. And so I think that's the, that's the key to, maybe change or add to our group of friends. We have, we have at least three questions here, four or five questions here. Is there, did you wanna? No, that, that woman over there, Errol. Okay, and then she was, you were next. I know you gotta there. go all the way across the room and get to her. I saw you directing our photographer <laughs> earlier. All right. Thanks. Um, so my name is Rachel, and I used to work, uh, well, I do work for ServiceNet, which is what Ira was trying to say earlier, rather than SafeNet. And Ira stayed with us at the shelter for a little while, and um, I'm, I, I couldn't be happier for you to see the success that you've made since you were here in Northampton, and I'm really glad to know that you call Northampton a home. Um, on a less ethereal note and on a more secretarial note, I think one of the things that's greatly missing when it comes to 
um, police violence against black men is actually statistics. There's no good record keeping that happens, and I think that's actually a real thing that could be asked for and legislated for, that there's better oversight for the police departments. It should have been known through record keeping that, it, that these gentlemen have all had previous experiences of violence, but because there actually is no good record keeping behind the, the uh, what do they call it, the thin blue wall, <laughs> um, that's unfortunately one of the, I think one of the pieces of it too. That's, it's a solution, it's very, um, well I work in statistics, so it's kind of mathematical, but I think that it is a, a real possible solution to try and to find out, to actually show to people you know, you can show them on screen, but people often believe numbers when they see numbers too. It's just a thought. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I just want to just say how interesting it is that we have statistics on all sorts of stuff. Yes. And we have the, the most minute, ridiculous things statistically figured out. Right. But we do not have any statistics there's no, there's no good and data statistics. from anywhere in the United States on how many police people have been killed by police. We haven't broken department. it down recently, nothing. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That's not a coincidence. Hi, I'm Sylvia. I'm a freshman at the local high school. I think I'm probably the youngest one here. Um, and I was wondering, what can I do? Every time I start talking about social justice issues, I'm shut down. Um, and I'm not the most educated, but I want to be. And I don't know where to go to find this information. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, I mean, that might be a really good question for the audience, um, because I'm not from this community, but I think one of the things, that, and I think you're, what you're taught, that issue that you're bringing up, which is finding solidarity as a young person with, with other young people who want to talk about social justice issues, is a huge issue that I notice, and I have always said, you know, it took me a couple years to realize my program where we're making films, the filmmaking is kind of an excuse for young people to have a safe space to talk honestly about things that they care about that they have no other place to talk about. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody in this room is a teacher or has access to youth spaces where that happens, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to find places like that. And you're right, and I think part of what happens in the school system is the days are so scheduled out that there isn't even a space to kind of breathe and think about those things first, let alone want to talk about them, right? So, um, so I empathize with your issue, and I know that, you know, like, that's something that I try to do as a as an after school teacher in my program, and you know I, I I feel lucky to work at a school where it's really all about social issues and emotional learning and all that. But it's rare. That's not something that happens um, everywhere. So I don't know if maybe someone in the audience, if there is, Do you got place, if anybody can be a resource for that young woman. I just want to um, expand on that before you get to her question. Um, that, that is definitely an uh, interesting point. And like we said, education is a, is a key. Tom said love. And when we talk about love, they want to like, you know what I'm saying? When we get together like this and we talk about loving one another, then there's a problem, you know what I'm saying? It's all right when we talk about killing each other and doing all this and all that. Oh, so you, know, you have an enemy, you have this, you know what I'm saying? Um, there's people that that's here that's about it, you know what I'm saying? And we could get frustrated, Miss Pika, you know what I'm talking about? You, you was in Albany with us, with the, and now you're here. Um, yeah, I'm just saying. But don't get frustrated. We got to keep going on. We have to keep going on. You have some white men like Tom that understand it, and he's trying to tell his, his brothers, you know, listen, we need to talk about this. But they're not, you know, they're not going to listen because they're scared that another Obama or another Ira McKinley is going to come in and they're going to change the whole system. And that's not even the point. We want to talk about loving one another. Kevin Cullen, he's up there and he was doing, he was doing like hula hooping and he was like, there was a whole bunch of people here that was talking about love. You know what I'm saying? But love doesn't, ex you know, it doesn't sustain on just we talking about it, we have to show it, you know what I'm saying? And Bowen knows I was about to quit this project here. It took us three years to make it. And how many times I quit? Um, probably at least 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> but he kept, he kept me going. So it was like, you know, and, and it was about love. And he was like, dude, if you really, you came to me, 
That's what he said. You came to me, and now you want to quit? You know what I'm saying? And I had to take a look at that, you know? But there's many times I wanted to quit this project because it was too hard, and we had subjects, but then the, the, the camera was focused on me. You know what I'm saying? So it was either make it happen or, you know, Forget it. And before you young ladies leave, buy a DVD or a T-shirt. You know, I'm just trying to say that to people because you know we need to keep going. Um, we have a couple of questions left. I know that you two are yes. next in order. Sure. Um, so I I completely agree with the the love and the friendship. You know, I think um, it's what divides us is fear, and you know, the love and the friendship and the connection can can help can be part of the solution. Um, but the other thing that you know. I think is important to talk about when we talk about white supremacy is as white people, you know, I think about as a white person, what should I do? You know, I need to hold myself accountable. And as white people, we need to talk about white complicity too. And the fact that if we don't talk, this doesn't end. Because unfortunately, our society places more value you know, erroneously on, on what, you know, the, the majority thinks and, you know, not in the sense of numbers, but, you know, what, what is, has more value in, in the eyes of society. So, you know, I remember when um, Nakreem was killed, I was in Albany, and I was sitting in a lunchroom full of white teachers in a school, and they said to me, well, you know how it is in those neighborhoods, you know? And white people have a way of thinking that when you're at a table with all white people, everybody thinks the same thing. And we don't think the same thing. And it's the courage of taking that risk and stepping out and saying to another white person, no, you know, what exactly are you talking about? So it's to interrupt that. And you know, I'm not asking a question and I'm sorry, I'm just kind of rambling, but it's important to, to as white people, we need to hold ourselves accountable. You know, we live in this little bubble of the valley, and you know, we think that we're progressive, but go to Springfield, you know? And we, we need to speak up and, and have that courage, you know, and, and to, to support you, you know? And that's all, really. Well, thank you for speaking that, Miss. Thank you. You wanna buy a T-shirt? I'm just kidding, no. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kay Olin. I had a couple of things to say. I hope I remember each one of them right now. First of all, I'm sorry the woman from ServiceNet left because there actually is a retired detective who has uh, accounted for every murder of a cop to a person of color that has been based fundamentally illegal. One thing we forget in this country is that racial discrimination is illegal. And this has become a problem with the institutional racism and intentional racism everywhere. And that's one reason why in education, children and adolescents aren't even aware of it anymore. Another thing is uh, that if you go to the internet and look up this retired cop, just put that in for uh, whoever has recorded cops who have been murdering blacks and uh, other people of color specifically, you will find it. Another thing is that I noticed that when Ira was speaking in the beginning, he mentioned, I've been arrested so many times, and there was a lot of laughter in the room. And I really want to say I personally take offense to that. I don't think it's funny that he's been arrested so many times at all. That's one of the problems is with uh, becoming so insensitized to it. The fact that any person of color has been arrested for anything is outrageous. It's morally outrageous. And we're responsible for that. Another thing is in regard to getting to speak up about um, racism specifically and how taxing it is on all of us, because for many of us it is, uh, I have a meeting at my house. I live on 19 Carpenter Avenue and behind the China Walk Express here in Northampton every third Saturday of the month from 2 to 4 o'clock. And it's called, I Can't Breathe. What's next? I Can't Breathe. So it is a support group for everybody, people of color and their allies specifically. So we can discuss monthly any aspect of racism that's impacted us throughout our entire lives. So it's just a way to express and get this out of our system and uh, get reality checks from one another about how we're coping, how we're surviving with this, what are we doing, or what have we been um, immobilized by cyclically 
In which way are we convinced that we're ineffective? In what ways are we convinced that there's nothing that we can do? So anyone is welcome to that, and you can speak to me after if you're interested. Um, I want to say I really thoroughly appreciated the film, and I liked very much the emphasis on the children in the film, because the film is about saving lives, it's about protecting, it's actually about constructing a quality of life because it's missing so desperately in so many people's lives right now. So it is about the hope of building something new in this country where the quality of life may still need to be fought for but can be assured. So I happen to pr appreciate that aspect of the film a great deal. I was a teacher, I worked in early childhood education for years, now I'm an author and a lecture. And um, so it just was very important to keep seeing throughout the film, looking at these children's lives and looking at the desperation and the depression that they're exposed to every day of their lives, not in every single respect, but certainly in regard to, to racism and the exposure to racism and its impact upon them and their families. So I just think it's something that white people specifically can consider and be far more effective about in their own homes, in their own schools, on their jobs, in their relationships. And that's what I wanted to say. So thank you very much for the film. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have two questions back here. Uh, certainly your film and the events of Ferguson and South Carolina and, and uh, the other incidences of police brutality in the news recently have confirmed that the racism is an extremely serious and systemic and deep problem um, among the police. My question is, what are the chances in your opinion that the problem is really much worse than racism? And that is that the police generally in this country are just completely out of control. Um, I don't think those two things are that inseparable, you know, and I think that's part of what um, I'm really interested in doing is to making sure that we're not trying to sort of compartmentalize things. Um, so like to say that, okay, basically it's like, yes, the police are out of control everywhere and that's going to be most felt and most, um, you know, uh, played out in poor communities, black communities and brown communities, right? So. Of course the police are out of control. I mean, NYP NYPD is like a straight up little, it's like an army, you know? And it's like, I, I have friends who, who, who are in NYPD and I know people who have been sort of, you know, cops who have sort of changed their personalities because of being in NYPD and the sort of gang mentality that it really um, sort of teaches. So yes, I do think the cops are out of control, but I think anytime you feel, you know, something is sort of out of control or like, you know, the economy crashed. Okay, well, who's gonna feel that the most? You know, folks who are already marginalized, folks who already face multiple daily oppressions because of the systematic, you know, issues of race, right? So I don't think that those things can sort of be compartmentalized. And I think until America deals with the reality that it really never accounted for the fact that, you know, it brought people from their country and it made them slaves, and the fact that it, you know, massacred millions of people who are already here, and then now is, building a wall so a lot of the descendants of those people cannot come back to the land that used to be theirs. Until we deal with those realities, you know, these issues are not going to end and not going to stop, you know. And I think it was so interesting, people heard the news lately, it's like Ben Affleck was like shocked and he wanted um, PBS to please, please, please do not tell people in that show that my great, great, great grandfather was a slave owner because he was embarrassed. You know, and, and Ben Affleck, you know, because he has the privilege of being a white male and also extremely rich, got his request accepted, right? So he didn't have to bear his dirty laundry. But I think what it points to is it sort of reveals that as much as every white person in this country wants to deny, not every, I'm sorry, as long as many white people who are affluent today want to deny the fact that they are directly beneficiaries of slavery, that's an inescapable truth, right? So when we talk about things like reparations, we can't just sort of laugh those things away and say, that's ridiculous, that wasn't my ancestors, that was. And what we see around us, a system that's built on capitalism, was propped up by white slave owners who passed those beneficent, beneficent um, benefits onto their family, 
right? So when you talk about things of like race and police brutality, they all arise out of the fact that there's a protection of, of folks who, who really in some ways understand that they're on stolen land on st and, and own stolen property um, and have to protect that at all costs. You know, so again, I think those decompartmentalizing of race and policing and poverty, I think they're, they're all connected. There's not a separation between them. And you know what I want to say? I want my 40 acres and a mule. That, that you know, that, that, that was supposed goat. to be 40 acres and a mule. How about a goat? Uh, reparations. How about a goat? We'll give you a goat and some chickens. Oh, yeah, goats and chickens. I forgot about we, that. We had, now, uh, if you ain't give me 40 please. acres and a mule, give me an acre and some chickens and a goat. I can make it happen. You know what I'm saying? But there's things that we can do that we can give back in reparations. And I know you guys don't want to give up all this stuff that you thought you fought for this, but you didn't fight for it. You used people to fight for you. And that's what capitalism is. It's about capitalizing on those who are weak. So let's be honest, you know what I'm saying? This is what's going on in this country. And it's a system that's been set up from the beginning and it's been told over and over again, and there was people talking about it that were slaves that were here. So Jordan Truth, Frederick Douglass, William Lord Garrison, who was a white man that, that did this, and then John Brown just started shooting people, and they was like, oh, you know what I'm saying? If he said, if I could do it again, I would. So I love people like Ryan Hamo because he did, he did, um, he sang, if you want me to, you remember that? <laughs> And he sounded just like um, Sly and the Family Stone. And I'm like, yo, I got to produce this brother and get him out there. So they're, they're, these are things that I want to show that we can work together on. And it's art and music and loving one another, like Tom said. I think we have time for one last question. Um, I want to address the young college person who said she was looking for ways to become more activist. And I think. Being here is one way, and hearing much of what you have to say and watching the movie, but also um, the suggestion that was made to go out to Springfield, go to, it's in building relationships with people of color that your own implicit bias, and we all have them, um, will begin to be challenged. When you get to know families who are just like your families, worry about the same things that your families worry about, um, struggle over the same things, that you begin to not see people of color as the other. Um, and that's when you find yourself sitting in a group of white people, I share that experience, who are making generalizations based on nothing, basically. And that's what gives you the courage to share your truth, your story about the families that you know and the truth that you have you know, learned through your own experience, and that makes a huge difference. To your film, what I would say was powerful for me were some of the scenes of the street, uh, the block party, um, the, the school parties, because they convey exactly that. Um, you spoke about the films that, um, yes, they're exciting, but they portray black men as dangerous, um, living on the edge, taking risks, that, what you were showing, does the opposite. It says these are people that have block parties and they dance and they bring their favorite foods and they, you know, they do what regular people do. And that, I think, is a very powerful image to counteract the onslaught that we get from the regular media. And one final point is to the woman who who's no longer here who mentioned statistics. In Connecticut, five years ago, they undertook looking at statistics about crime. And if you go and um, were to Google the color of justice, it's a PBS special that was done in Connecticut about the criminal justice system and incarceration of juveniles in Connecticut. And it's done as a training film for everyone in the correction systems, from the probation officers to the correctional officers to the police force. And it actually has parts of it where they're being challenged about their own implicit biases. Um, there's an exercise that they do where you know the same person is dressed two different ways. And they're asked to give their first three adjectives off the top of their head. 
and then at the end they're shown how, depending how that person happened to be dressed that day, they thought they were either studious and conscientious or they were a thug. And so there, there, are, there is work, there's hope that uh, even within the system, there's work about to try to, to bring change. Um, and there's a Juvenile Justice Alliance in Connecticut that is showing that film all over the state and again, using it as a tool to you know, build solidarity and get the word out and, and educate people about what Michelle Alexander writes about in her book. So that's all I had to say, but it's like, go out, go out and volunteer and, and meet people. That's when, we need to bring the races together. Yes, we need to bring justice. We have to bring those cops to justice, but we also have to get to know each other as human beings so that we can bridge those gaps. Mm -hmm. All right, clearly there's a lot of, yeah. A lot of conversation, um, an interesting conversation here in the community about these issues, and I want to thank Ira and Bowen for, for sharing their film with us tonight, and I encourage everyone here to, to continue the conversation amongst ourselves and to reach out to Ira and Bowen uh, if you have other questions and to reach out to NCTV if you have any interest in connecting with us as well. So thank you very Can much. I, um, I just want to add a couple of promotional yeah. things because yeah, I really have to do this because I'm really bad at doing this. Yeah. But if you want to stay in touch with us, we have a, a website. It's throwawaysmovie.com. Um, we are at throwawaysdoc on Twitter, and we're on Facebook as well. Um, you guys know Ira, and Ira and I have done this completely grassroots. We got no major funding. We did this ourselves. We're hoping to get a national broadcast, which is why we can't sell the DVD publicly yet. So the only opportunity you have to pick up this DVD is on this tour and the t-shirts were made by a friend of ours who's an uh, artist in Albany. She made the design. Um, and one of the things I just want to say to, to sort of, as a closing thing is, to me the really kind of amazing thing about this film is the fact that the film was also a vehicle for Ira to reconcile with things that he was dealing with. And I just want to say that it takes a lot of bravery to have someone point a camera at you for two and a half years. So I just want to give it up one more time for Ira to be able to tell his story. So thank you. And I thank all y'all for coming out and supporting me today because we all are family. I would sing, we, uh, you know, but that, you know, we'll do that later, all right? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>